A few moments ago, Buckingham Palace announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Breaking news from Scotland here at Balmoral, where Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II has passed away at the age of 96. The Queen is dead. At 96, Elizabeth II is gone. The news came through just a few minutes ago. It was released on the royal family's Twitter account. The statement reads, the Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. It's been one year since the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, the end of the monarchy as we all knew it. It is a day of great loss, but Queen Elizabeth II leaves a great legacy. Today, the crown passes, as it has done for more than a thousand years, to our new monarch, our new head of state, His Majesty, King Charles III. Seven News Europe Bureau Chief, Hugh Whitfield, has been covering the royal family for years. On September 8, 2022, Hugh and Seven cameraman James Cannon were the first journalists in the world on the scene at Balmoral as history was made. The amazing thing was this wasn't just a momentous week in terms of the change of the monarch. It had already been a history making week because we were up in Scotland because the Queen was overseeing the changeover of Prime Minister. Liz Truss had arrived shortly after Boris Johnson had left Balmoral Castle on the Tuesday. The whole country and all of us had been expecting that momentous change of Prime Minister, which in itself was an important occasion. We were up in Scotland. We chose to stay on for another 24 hours. We, we felt like we had a few more stories to pick up there. And then on the Wednesday night, uh, we received word that the Queen had pulled out of a Privy Council Zoom meeting. Now, over the course of the previous 12 months, we knew that she'd had some health ailments. She experienced COVID, of course, back in February of 2022, but had been able to continue working virtually on these Zoom meetings. So the fact that for the first time to our knowledge, she'd pulled out of a Zoom meeting, if she wasn't well enough to get in front of a computer screen and basically oversee a meeting of a dozen or so people, then something was seriously wrong. We made it back to Balmoral that night, were there the next morning. We were the first journalists on the ground there at Balmoral. And then what played out was obviously a history making, history defining day. I received phone calls from <clears throat> people close to the palace who told me not to go anywhere, that the Queen's health had deteriorated to the extent that the change of sovereign was going to happen that day and I think the, the, the truth is that it all happened very quickly. Charles was in Dumfries House in the south of Scotland. He was only scrambled to Balmoral on that morning of September 8 when it became apparent that the Queen was unlikely to survive the day. Uh, and then around lunchtime, Liz Truss barely 48 hours into her Prime Ministership. She's trying to lay out this ambitious domestic agenda in the House of Commons. She slipped a piece of paper by her Cabinet Minister, Nadim Zahawi, which we now know is her being informed that the Queen was gravely ill and momentous things were about to happen. All of this was playing out live on TV. So very quickly, the nation became aware that things were beginning to move quickly and that the country and the Commonwealth had to prepare itself for history changing news. Over the course of that afternoon, of course, we saw this scramble of members of the royal family, Prince William, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, up to Balmoral. Charles was at that point there, along with his sister, Princess Anne, who was already in Scotland. There was this very sad scramble by Prince Harry as well, effectively left behind by his brother and his uncles, having to catch a commercial flight to Aberdeen. He didn't make it in time to see the Queen by the time she'd passed away. 
It was a wet day. It was a very sombre day at Balmoral. Um, news crews who, who quickly discovered that they needed to be at Balmoral were scrambling up there. It became busier as, as locals from Aberdeenshire and Scotland tried to get there as well. And then of course that moment at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Scotland time, 3.30 in the morning in the, uh, on the Australian East Coast, that news came through that the Queen had passed away. And this was an event we were preparing for, for I was preparing, I've been preparing for for the last nine years. And so there were one of two ways that it could have gone, obviously. The Queen may have ended up in hospital for, with this long illness that had her bedridden for months, years. I mean, she was a woman in her mid-90s anything could have happened to her. Um, I think the fact that it happened so quickly. On the Tuesday, we'd seen her up and about greeting Liz Truss in front of the fireplace at Balmoral Castle. She looked really old. I mean, everyone who saw that photo knew that she'd changed in the couple of months since we'd seen her. She looked incredibly thin. She looked tiny, this tiny old woman. Um, but I think just the speed that it ended up happening in the end and I think for her you know we've all got grandparents great-grandparents who we've seen go over the course of our lifetimes and I think for her it was a bit of a blessing she was in her favorite place and it did all happen very quickly she wasn't convalesced for a long period of time and and, and her family knew that it was coming um, but in the end it it happened really quickly and that day unfolded really quickly as well at Balmoral between waking up in the morning, having a sense that this could be the day that it all unfolded and then by lunchtime knowing that, uh, that it was going to be a day that we'd all remember and a day that would change the country and the Commonwealth forever. The, the bit that gave me goosebumps was not just the fact that the Queen had died because we were expecting that message to come through, but the term the King and Queen will remain in Balmoral tonight and will return to London tomorrow. And that was the first time in more than seven decades that the palace had released a statement with the words the king in it. And I think that was the first moment for me, certainly, that I realised, we realised that the change had happened and a massive series of events was about to unfold over the next 10 days. <laughs> Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. It is my most sorrowful duty to announce to you the death of my beloved mother, the Queen. I know how deeply you, the entire nation, and I think I may say the whole world, sympathise with me in the irreparable loss we've all suffered. Well, I think the, the, the thing to remember is that um, whenever this happens, and this is something the palace had spoken about when we'd been briefed over the years, is that there's two duelling narratives that play out. There's the death of the monarch and the mourning period that uh, needs to happen in order to fully reflect and respect a reign. And then there's this dawn of a new age. And what we saw was the dawn of a Carolean era. I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set in upholding constitutional government and to seek the peace, harmony and prosperity of the peoples of these islands and of the Commonwealth realms and territories throughout the world. 
no amount of preparation for what he would be feeling on that day, no amount of conversations of how he would prepare his speech, his address to the nation and the world. I think it would have all gone out the window because the feelings of sadness that he would have felt at the passing of his mother would have really overtaken the moment. And yet in that moment that he did give his speech to the world, I think we saw the character and the purpose of what a man he wants to, uh, to become in this role as king. The thing that struck me is that 24 hours after his mother had died, Charles was in London where he needed to be as the new king. And he was embracing the people and the people were embracing him. Oh, I'm gonna take that kiss forever. I kissed his hand as well. It was impulsive. He's a kiss the king's hand. Keep in mind that he had just lost his mother, he was mourning the loss of his cherished mother and then was out and about outside Buckingham Palace, shaking hands, being kissed by people, greeting people, speaking with people, with Camilla by his side. He's stopping. Camilla is getting out of the car right getting now. Out. The They're king getting is out. getting out of the vehicle right now. They're going to do a walkabout. <laughs> Well, actually, I think that really what happened in the immediate aftermath of the Queen's death was a, a lot of people had em empathy and sympathy with the King because of the way he spoke, which was very eloquently, very lovingly about his mother, but also the way, he, you know, he sort of was clearly taking it all on his shoulders. A lot of people think, and I think, you know, some understanding of they've all been there, most people, they've lost someone they love, and I think that helped him. The, the, the way that the people re responded to him helped him. I think he was touched by the response he got. And if you think about it, you are appointed to that position the very second that the, the previous monarch dies. So you take it on immediately. Uh, he had a coronation to plan. He had uh, grief. He had issues to deal with. He had to consider whether his brother Andrew, whether Harry, whether that were military uniforms in that, that time of mourning. So there was a lot of pressure on and we saw immediately uh, that pressure sort of combust in his altercation with a pen. In those days after his mother's death, he had to uh, visit all the realms, Ireland, Wales, Scotland, England. I mean, it was pretty gruelling. And we have to remember, he is a man who is now 74. He didn't come to the throne in his mid-twenties like his mother. He came to the throne at a time of his life when most people are retiring. So even though Charles was in his 70s, he brought a new energy to the monarchy straight away, I think. And... He needs to keep that up going forward. But, but that's the thing that struck me. Straight away we had a monarch on his feet, out and about, with the people. Despite, you know, leaky pens and slightly bad tempered along the way, um, in the first couple of months I think that actually he did pretty well in that transition. Problem I think came um, when of course we had the, the Harry book and all the issues that followed. When Charles became king, his family was in crisis. From Harry to Andrew, to the lack of senior royals to carry out his work. His first big test began well before his coronation. Well, there's three big challenges he faces with his family. The first one, of course, is Harry. And the second one is Andrew. I think the jury is still out on how he's handled those issues early on. We look at the controversies over the last 12 months, these are potentially not going to go away anytime soon because I think you look at the family matters at heart, we've had scandal and infighting in abundance over the last few years and that is something that the King really does need to get to grips with. What is the relationship with his son Prince Harry? He said it would be one of love and affection pretty much in his first speech to the world and yet we've seen Harry on the other side of the Atlantic dropping these bombs all over the place and the relationships are still in tatters and I think that people would expect King Charles to try and bring Harry back into the fold to try and be the bigger person in the argument. Harry, the thing with Harry is that he's got William as well. Now William can be 
a positive and a negative in this relationship. William and Kate uh, appeared outside Windsor Castle in the days after the Queen's death alongside Harry and Meghan. It was ice cold. It was so tense. You could cut the tension with a knife. They were not getting along. They are not getting along. It's not just the relationship between Harry and his father, the King. It's the relationship between Harry and his brother, William. William has the ear of his father. If Harry's relationship with Charles is going to be restored, it needs to be restored with William as well. My brother and I love each other. I love him deeply. I thought that the, you know, the four of us would you know, bring me and William closer together. We could go out and do work together. There needs to be a constructive conversation, one that can happen in private. What I have to say to them will be in private. The key thing I think they've done that's been very wise is that they have taken the damage limitation view that they will say nothing about spare. So there hasn't been a single comment of about Harry's book, which of course came out in early January, just a few months after the Queen's death. It made these extraordinary claims. It revealed family secrets. It, uh, you know, threw daggers at various people, uh, but they didn't say a word. And interestingly, now, nine months on from the publication of that book, we have Harry and Meghan who look on more shaky ground than ever. They don't have a purpose. They have been cut off from some of the partnerships. Uh, Meghan is reportedly wanting to kickstart her career. Harry, of course, has the Invictus Games, but really has no other uh, large scale purpose that we're aware of. Like I curtsied as though I was like, Pleasure to meet you, Your Majesty. Like, was that okay? Harry's on the outer. He's made the decision. He and Meghan have made the decision to be in California. The door, they'll say, is always open for Harry to return. It's practically impossible for him to come back to the full-time role that he had before. His two, his two children are American. They will be raised in America by Meghan. There is no appetite from the Duchess of Sussex to return to the UK. I think... To be honest, the attitude from the palace and from the king is just to let it go and let Harry be Harry. He seems to have got most of the gripes that he's got off his chest now. There's a lot that can happen between now and then, but you know, the door is always open. The, the ball is in their court. There's a lot to be discussed and I really hope that they are willing to sit down and talk about it. The second issue being Andrew is much more delicate. There are still big questions about any actions that Andrew may face from the complainants against him, whether or not he may face further legal issues down the track in the United States. Andrew, it is clear now, behind closed doors, has been accepted back into the family, as has his ex-wife, Sarah Ferguson, who he lives with at Royal Lodge. It seems as though the move to Frogmore Cottage um, that was signalled because Harry and Meghan are being forced to move out of there, is on hold. Andrew seems to have gotten his way by being able to stay in Royal Lodge on the Windsor Estate. Um, that's privately. Publicly, there's no way that Prince Andrew would be able to turn up to a public event in the UK and not be heckled to such an extreme extent that it's probably the sort of thing that we haven't seen for decades for a member of the royal family. It's just not going to happen. On the eve of the anniversary of the Queen's passing, Andrew was spotted alongside senior royals, something the Daily Mirror's royal editor, Russell Myers, thinks was a major misstep. Over the last couple of days, we've seen uh, Prince Andrew riding shotgun, riding front and centre with uh, Prince William and Princess Kate. And what does that look like for the royal family? I thought it was a bit of a PR disaster to have Andrew front and centre with the family at church because you know he's had to leave in disgrace this is something that the the royal family wants to try and sweep under the carpet they think that the business with virginia Giffray is done and dusted but i think that that is far from it for the public and if there was a rehabilitation of prince andrew then i think a lot of the public would find that pretty unpalatable indeed but king charles's biographer rob jobson disagrees he thinks both harry and andrew have no official future as royals I think that he's been dealt with both Harry and Andrew. I think that um, it's clear that neither will come back as working royals. There's a lot of nonsense talked, I think, uh, 
summer stories, I call them, about will Andrew now come back because he was seen in Balmoral? Well, he was there at Christmas at Sandringham. I mean, it's a family gathering. At family gatherings, Andrew, be, Andrew will be there, but he's in deep storage when it comes to um, being a working role. In fact, not storage, deep freeze. He's not coming out. That job is over for him. And the same for, for Harry. There's a lack of trust for Harry and the other members of the royal family, particularly William and Camilla. So I don't see that ever resolving itself. Charles has spoken a lot about wanting a slimmed down monarchy. It is pretty slim now. It's just Charles and Camilla, the King and the Queen, the Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Kate, the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh, Edward and Sophie, and Princess Anne and her husband, Sir Tim Lawrence. Anne is also getting on in age. So is Tim Lawrence. The Edinburghs aren't gonna be working forever either. It really falls to the Waleses. And at some point in the next probably 15 years, you're gonna see Prince George doing royal duties as well. When you look at the, the, the business of the royal family, I think they've got to really club together. The slim down monarchy is looking slimmer by the day. And that is something that Princess Han has commented on in the past. And they've got to club together, a bit more collaboration, less drama, and we can all but hope that it all goes swimmingly for them, I suppose. And when you hear sometimes people refer to a slim-down monarchy, I, I can't imagine what, what that might mean for a role like yours. I, I don't know how many more hours in the day you have to take more things on. <laughs> well, I think the slim-down was, was said in a day when there were a few more people around to make that seem like a justifiable right. <laughs> comment. The um, world changes a bit. It changes a bit. I mean, it doesn't sound like a good idea from where I'm standing. <laughs> Charles has got the slim-down monarchy he wants, but the danger he faces is that it gets too slimmed down. And so he's gonna to have to come up with a plan to make sure that there's enough working royals to not just cover events in the UK, but also around the Commonwealth, and that includes Australia. A slimmed down monarchy means senior members will need to work hard to ensure the public keep their faith in the institution. And playing a crucial role is Camilla. Hugh says the Queen is one of Charles's biggest assets. 20 years ago, if you asked people how they would feel about Queen Camilla, there would have been overwhelming negativity towards her because of the way that she came into the relationship and the history with Princess Diana. Well, a lot of people were quite surprised, strangely, that she, you know, even though we all knew in the media she was going to be crowned, a lot of people were saying, oh, I didn't realise she was going to be crowned. Well, you know, that's what happens when the King is crowned, the, the, the Queen is crowned alongside him. I don't think she's put, uh, put a foot wrong for like over 10, 15 years since they've been together, you know, like in terms of marital situation. She's worked hard, she supports him as much as she can. But there'll always be people that will say that she was the wrecker of the, the first marriage and not accept that the fact is that Charles and Camilla have now been married longer than Charles and Diana ever were and um, that they get on better and they're in love and they support each other through thick and thin. So, look, you know, marriages don't work sometimes and that first one didn't work. But I think a lot of people um, see Camilla as a, as a good supporting wife to the king and, uh, you know, he needs all the help he can get. Well, Camilla has played a blinder over the last 12 months. It's been very, very much a supportive role of the king, keeping her hand in with her patronages and her charity, still working diligently on uh, women's domestic violence, still working diligently on children's literacy, two passion projects of hers. And I don't see that changing anytime soon, if at all. <laughs> that one's my favourite. <laughs> She has worked so hard over the last 18 years since Charles and Camilla married to build up credit with the people. She, has excel she excels herself in public duties when she's meeting with members of the public. She puts people at ease. She's relaxed. She comes to the role not with any great royal blood. So she has the touch of a commoner. She's able to talk to people. You know, you'll see her go to events and she's the one who's willing to pick up the piece of cheese and try it at the farmer's markets. She's the one that's willing to pat the sheep in the, in the farmyard on a trip to a, to a farm. She's willing to embrace people and reach out. And I think the people have responded well to that. She's lost that kind of devilish 
persona that was given to her by, well, not just members of the British media, but also, it seems, Prince Harry behind the scenes as well. Camilla is a massive asset to Charles. And for William and Kate, they're the stars. They're the young new stars. Welcome, George. Welcome to Lambert. Hello, Louis. Louis. Welcome. <laughs> and Charlotte. welcome, Charlotte. Lovely to have you with, with us. They're the family that everyone kind of wants to have, I guess, with George, Charlotte and Louis. Their challenge, though, is balancing that family life that they're so desperate to have with the royal duties that they need to carry out. Charles's other key asset is the newly crowned Prince and Princess of Wales. They are the future of the royal family and how they perform their roles in the coming years will be pivotal for the king and his legacy. They have these titles now, the Prince and Princess of Wales. There is so much history that goes with those titles, not just Charles, but also his late wife Diana and William's mother, and Kate taking on that title is momentous in itself. They have a big challenge to carve out their own roles and their own future with those titles. Charles did an incredible job as the Prince of Wales over 50 years uh, with his Prince's Trust and the work that he did with the charities and the causes that he wanted to, uh, to champion. William has set his sights on the environment in particular and they both have on mental health. Kate also has her uh, interests in early years development and the like, um, but they really need to strike out and make those titles their own. The dilemma that they face is that they are so desperate to be ordinary parents for their three children and any time that takes them away from Adelaide Cottage where they live now on the Windsor Estate um, is difficult for them because they want to be the ones who take the kids to school and pick them up from school as well. They want to be around, they want to be present like a normal family might be able to. The challenge that they face is that they're not a normal family and they probably need to lift their game a little bit in terms of public appearances, just purely being present a bit more, I think. One year into the reign of Charles and it's been labelled one of mixed success, depending on where in the Commonwealth his report card is written. I think when you look at the first 12 months of King Charles on the throne, has it been a success or has it not? I think that, that the jury is still out because it's been a bit of a quiet year in some senses. I think some people would have expected to see a lot more foreign travel. Should he have gone out to the Commonwealth straight away? Should we have expected a trip to Australia as well? I certainly was hoping for one and I think it's been a bit of a slow grind over the first 12 months trying to get to grips with what the business of running the monarchy, running the firm, is all about. Look, I think in Britain, it's sort of an 8 out of 10, I think he's done very well, but I think you've got to look at also, you know, his role as King uh, of Australia, King of New Zealand, of Canada and the other realms, because I don't think that's gone very well. I think that the, to, to pick Germany and France, you know, he's now doing France in a few weeks' time, as your first two visit sort of puts a lot of emphasis on Europe and Brexit and post-Brexit when frankly you're if you're the head of the Commonwealth and you are the King of Australia you should be going to Australia I think within the first year now I understand he'll go there next October ahead of Chogham but I think that was a missed opportunity. William not going to the the Women's World Cup in Australia to watch England play even for that England-Australia match I think everyone will concede was a misstep. There's all sorts of rumours and reporting here about the fact that he can't go before Charles goes to Australia as the new king. It's absolutely rubbish because, of course, Queen Elizabeth II was the first monarch, reigning monarch, to go to Australia. Her or, or the previous to 1952, when uh, the Georges were the king of Australia, Queen Victoria, King Edward, um, they sent their heirs to the throne. And so the 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 argument that William couldn't go before Charles is just yeah, it's just not true. We're sorry we can't be there in person, but we're so proud of everything you've achieved and the millions you've inspired here and around the world. Good luck, Lionesses. That when the Women's World Cup was on, everyone's going on about William going there as head of the FA. Well, actually, I think it was a bigger situation than that. When England and, and Australia were playing in the Women's World Cup semi-final, I think the King of Australia should have been there. Uh, along with, as being the King of Great Britain too, because you know he could have one could have worn an Australian shirt, one could have worn an England shirt. Just make a bit of fun with it, and I understand that it's a long way to go, 
Um, but you could combine that with the trip to the Great Barrier Reef and just make it work. You know, I think in terms of adapting to situations on the hoof, I think they missed an the opportunity there. That was a great opportunity when the Matildas played the Lionesses, huge crowds, talking about you know women's uh, soccer, big moment in Australia, and I think that the Kings should have been there, not just William. The question will be, well, when are they going to go? Charles hasn't visited a Commonwealth country in his first 12 months as King, neither has William and Kate. And you have to ask, at what point are they going to visit Australia? At what point are they going to go to New Zealand and Canada? Um, they need to really quickly lay out their plans for keeping the Commonwealth on board. And that appears to be one of the biggest challenges King Charles is facing. Charles began his reign with a huge amount of goodwill from the public. They knew that he was a man who'd lost his mother. Um, but the Queen had so much credit stored in the bank before she died. Um, apart from in the 90s, the handling of Diana's death, um, there weren't too many things in modern times that you could point to the Queen where she got it wrong or was burning through capital with the public too much. Charles has some in the bank, but not as much as his late mother. And so that's why I think we do see now when the King in particular appears in the UK at a public event, the chance that you'll see Republican protesters, um, and they have been popping up at various events, particularly this year. Um, people who were Republican in the UK really held off until the Queen passed away. And they view Charles's reign as an opportunity to make a change in the UK. No one's really sure what that change would be. It's not an argument that they lay out, um, but that is Charles's challenge. Rob Jobson takes a different view. He believes the King is in charge of a stable Commonwealth, despite it shrinking over the years and the rise of Republican rumblings in the UK and Australia. I think as the head of Commonwealth, everyone talks the Commonwealth is in trouble. It's not. The Commonwealth is stronger than ever before. Yeah, OK, the Commonwealth Games may not be happening, but that's more to do with the, that used to be called the Friendly Games. When that started, you know, there weren't so many emphasis on Olympics and, and uh, World Championships. So that's a completely different matter. I think that the, the Commonwealth itself is pretty healthy. As, as in terms of a republic and whether Australia will ever become one, I think it's inevitable that Australia become a republic. But first of all, they've got to work out what they want, how they, what they want their president to be. You know, the, the point of it is at the moment there's a governor general and a system that works, um, constitutional monarchy, parliamentary democracy. And if you kind of change things, I think it's going to be rather than a yes or no vote in, and getting majorities in territories and states, you've got to work out what is that person, the president, and how they're going to elect him. If it's going to be by the general public, that then creates almost like a, another king or a, you know, a situation that's in America and puts him at loggerheads with a prime minister who's the executive power. So I think they've got to sort out a lot of things other than whether a yes goes first or no. Charles's base level success as king is essentially keeping the monarchy in place. Anything beyond that is a massive success. The failure becomes when the Republican chat in the UK gets too loud to the point where government ministers or the government starts discussing it. And that's when the, it, it's a long way off, but it exists more now than it did when the Queen was on the throne. But now it's Charles who's on the throne. On the anniversary of the Queen's passing, the family will be honouring her in private at Balmoral, the place the Queen loved the place the Queen went to escape her troubles and ultimately the place where she left this world. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. It's now up to her son and his small circle of family to keep her legacy and her monarchy alive. I think that it's a tough, she's a, definitely a tough act to follow, but I don't think the King is looking at it that way. I think he's looking at it as a modern monarch, somebody who, after all, in a world where we are slightly devoid of statesmen, 
He is a statesman, he's got great, vast experience on the world stage. And I think when he speaks on behalf of Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, whoever he's speaking with after consulting the Prime Minister, he speaks as a statesman, and I think that's good for all of us. You know, I've covered the, the royal family story since the early 90s, and you know, I think you know, I've covered the death of Princess Diana, um, death of Duke of Edinburgh. You know, what we've seen in the last 18 months um, has been huge, and I think it's seismic, really. I mean, you know, the loss of Her Majesty the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, has left us all in a bit of a strange place, both in the UK and Australia and all, all around the world. She put up with all of us. That's quite an achievement, I think. Coping with so many different challenges and complications and always being there, really, in, in that remarkable way. Steadfast. In terms of the Queen's legacy, no, I think it's very hard for anyone to really define and describe the enormity of the Queen's reign. You can't say that the Queen invented the internet, stopped wars or, you know, brought world peace. But what she did do is keep a level of stability, not just in the UK, but in Commonwealth countries as well, that I think was valuable over a time in history that has been so fundamentally transformative in so many ways, politically, in terms of technology that we deal with. When you look at the world in the 1950s when the Queen came to the throne and the world today, the only real constant was her. And she managed to adapt and keep her relevance alive for so long. That is a remarkable achievement in itself. And beyond that is the emotional attachment that people had to that stability. And that's what they were really mourning when people were crying at the Queen's death. They were mourning the loss of a woman that they revered, but also fundamentally as well, the loss of a sense of stability through a tumultuous time.